So Reggie, it's 2013, United States of America, it's a new year, it's a new day, but there's always something with the financial climate in America. What's the next bubble, Reggie? Well, let's look at it from the perspective of uh, how I named my site, Boom Bus Blog. It's not just a catch, you know, a catchy phrase. I named it to be descriptive of the way uh, the country's run over the last, you know, 20 years, 20, 30 years or so. 30, 40 years. Um, economic cycles and business cycles have um, trolls and peaks. You know, it goes up and down. There's no smooth sailing. So you have ups and downs. These ups and downs are being exacerbated by the TP, uh, TB, the powers that be, um, and the attempt to protect the oligarchy beyond what market forces would normally entail. Um, so instead of having peaks and troves, we now have booms and busts, hence boom, bus blog. Um, these booms and these busts are getting ever more exaggerated, ever more violent. Um, significant wealth can be made, but significant wealth can be lost at the same time. And it's getting to the point where market forces no longer um, rule the day. Um, with that being said, um, we have yet to fully shake off the ramifications of the last bust because we never allowed it to actually bust because of the protection of the oligarchy. And before the last bust um, has worn off, and it's been five or six years now, we have the next one, the next bust approaching. And the next bubble that I see is the education bubble. And uh, interesting, people say, what's an education bubble? Does that mean you're learning too much? And quite to the contrary, um, many are not learning much at all and are not learning much of, of value at all. And what makes this more dangerous than the previous uh, mortgage crisis is that mortgages were taken out on properties. The mortgages were excessive against properties with either excessive stated value, a lie, or false value. But there was some value there. You know, I take out a mortgage on this building. The mortgage could be for a billion dollars. The building's only worth, you know, a hundred million. But you know, at the end of the day, there's a hundred million dollars to recover off of this billion dollar mortgage. With the education bubble, you have um, certain groups, certain social economic demographic groups that are being preyed upon, um, where they want to seek a better way of life. Hence, they're going after degrees, certificates, uh, other stated proof or forms of so-called education, and they're taking excessive loans out to attain this. These loans are, again, much too easy to get. You know, the underwriting is sloppy, um, and it's backed by the government, like the mortgages were. So you have excess liquidity, and then these loans are taken out for these groups to get the diploma. Even if they successfully get their certificate, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, etc. Okay, the value of this degree is suspect. A lot of the MBAs that graduate couldn't earn their way out of a wet paper bag. You know, despite that, they have a bravado and a false confidence that says, you know, I'm worth you know, $100,000 upon graduation, please pay me this. The real value is if you're truly worth that, then if you were put into the marketplace, you can generate said $100,000. Even in the workplace, you'll find a lot of MBAs cannot do such, but despite that, they spent $120,000, $180,000, $250,000 on their education. So when you have uh, overstated or false value on the asset, which is a diploma, yet you have a debt, and uh, in the case of student loans, this debt is not distinguishable. You know, it's not dischargeable in bankruptcy. It's pretty much permanent. You have the makings of a new bubble, okay? The student loan bubble, uh, the student loan um, market is roughly about a trillion dollars as of right now by the end 
by the beginning of the second quarter, to the middle of the second quarter, I estimated it to be over $1.3 trillion, which means it will be bigger than the subprime uh, bubble from just a few years ago. And despite the fact it's been bigger and it's blown the exact same way by creating an artificial government backing of loans that weren't correctly underwritten to back assets that had a false or fictitious, fictitious or overstated value, you have a big mess going. And again, um, because you have so many diplomas, because the diplomas are teaching things that are not necessarily of value, you know, you have a significant drop in assets once they're marked to market. You mark diplomas and people are seeking this education to market by having them getting out in the world and trying to make money with their diplomas, either by getting a job or by monetizing it directly. You know, there are a lot of people, you know, go ask a lot of your friends, anybody who's graduated from school, whether it's uh, high school, associate's degree, bachelor's, master's, ask them, say, exactly how much do I use of my diploma and what I do right now? You know, I'm pretty sure more than one out of 15 people will say, you know, I really didn't use much of my master's degree, my marketing degree, my, you know, it's, it's, you know XYZ degree. Now, there are certain diplomas that, you know, are definitely worthwhile. Like if you're an electrical engineer, you're going to use a significant part of your electrical engineering degree, okay? But I know a lot of people who've gotten bachelor's and master's MBAs, you know, in business and have used relatively little. Definitely didn't use $170,000 worth. To put this to the test, assume you went to a four-year college, you get a bachelor's degree, paying roughly $40,000 a year, interest 6%, okay? you spending roughly $172,000, $176,000 for this education, okay? Um, let's say it's for a master's in computer science, okay? You compare this guy, right, who has $160,000 of debt, $60,000 in interest that's accruing from the day he graduates unless he postpones it, okay? But it's still accruing, just doesn't have to pay it immediately. And you compare this to the guy who took that $160,000, right, he put it in the stock market. The Nasdaq returned 98% over the last four years. And then he interned with Google for free. Okay, didn't get a job. He said, you know, I'm going to intern at Google. I want to learn the ins and outs. You don't have to pay me a dime. You just need to teach me what you do. If you were um, a small or medium businessman, who would you hire? The person who had the four-year degree from the average school, okay, or the person who interned at Google? Well, Google created Android. Well, Google created uh, the competition for Facebook. Well, Google basically, you know, took over the world. You know, I think, you know, person B is significantly more valuable. On top of that, right, he would have doubled his $170,000 in the stock market, okay? Even if the stock market took a loss, let's say it was a 50% um, drop, where he crapped out with the stock market shoot, okay? It's still, he would have had $80,000, right, with a loss of 80000 so he would have owed roughly $96,000, right? He still would have had the education from Google. He would have got p potentially and quite likely a superior education at less than half the cost. And that's a taking a 50% loss in investments. Reality showed he would have had a 98% gain. Of course, the way loans work, you don't have all the money up front. So most likely it'd be more like a 50% gain. But this is a hypothetical just to show you that most people, when they go for education, they don't think of their education as an investment. They think of something that they think of the education as something that they need to get. I have to get this piece of paper because this piece of paper has value and I need to get it by any means necessary. That's not the case. When you go for education, you're investing in yourself and you have to do a cost benefits um, analysis, you know, risk reward analysis. How much does it cost to get this diploma? How much is the diploma worth? Versus how much does it cost to get another type of education? It's a difference between, from a philosophical perspective, knowledge that and knowledge how. Knowledge of that is knowledge of facts, of bits of information, specific things. Knowledge how is knowledge on basically how to do things, okay? A perfect example would be universities and academia deal in knowledge that, and they peddle knowledge that, and they peddle it on a, peddle it on a levered basis, which means they um, peddle it and they arrange you to get loans to get knowledge that. Knowledge that and riding a bicycle would be um, knowing the physics behind pedaling a bike, right, and the forces that it takes to keep the bike bounced, okay? Knowledge how would be the knowledge of being able to get on a bike and actually riding it, okay? One is more valuable than another from an um, economic perspective, particularly if you need to ride a bike, okay? Universities push knowledge that, 
the old apprenticeship system in the United States before um, the Prussian school system became popular was the knowledge how methodology. And I think it's the knowledge how methodology that created the basis of what made America great. Not knocking all schools and not knocking all academia, but the academic system as it stands now from kindergarten up until PhD level is broken in terms of creating productive, creative, innovative thinkers, independent thinkers versus robots who specialize in rote memorization, memorizing things like times tables and facts and figures versus developing the creativity, the uh, curiosity, the inquisitive mind that comes up with the actual figures themselves versus memorizing them.